Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to this presentation about the Sydney and the Cormoran. It's being presented as a joint presentation by Gillian Lewis and Noel Phelan. And it's quite a comprehensive uh, summary of the events uh, about the uh, tragedy itself and the searching for the shifts, which I think you will find very interesting. Can I just mention that, uh, as I said, it's fairly comprehensive, but there is a facility to ask any questions if you want to, which may be dealt with uh, at the end if there's time. You'll see at the bottom of your screen there's a Q&A spot. You can, if you like, uh, write, type in a little question there. Now we can go straight on to the presentation. I hand over now to Gillian Lewis. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you, Kingsley. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody today, uh, particularly those from Western Australia who've uh, uh, risen early to listen in. I can imagine you're all crunching your toast and rattling your wheat pick spoon. We hope you all enjoy it. Uh, Noel and I are both volunteer speakers at the Australian National Maritime Museum. We have no Navy experience, but we have a real interest in the Navy and particularly the Sydney Cormoran story, but for different reasons. On November 19th, it was the 79th anniversary where we remembered the 645 crew from Sydney and the 82 from Cormoran who lost their lives on that fateful night. This presentation has been thoroughly researched for many resources and a lot of hours have been put in to tailor make this for the NHSA today. We've actually combined two presentations, the battle and the finding. So you will hear the full Sydney Cormoran story, including a bit of a conundrum at the end. So please stay with us. Uh, we should take around about an hour and a quarter. So without further ado, uh, I shall begin. These are our references that uh, we have uh, used plus a huge amount of uh, information from the internet. Uh, these are the uh, sections that we will cover. And as Kingsley mentioned, we'll have a Q&A at the end. So let's look at the two ships. We'll firstly look at Cormoran. She was the ex Hamburg America Steiermark. Uh, she was a, a commercial vessel and she was one uh, that was chosen to convert to a Hilfkreuzer. Now the German Navy actually converted nine ships to Hilfkreuzers for World War II. Uh, she had uh, quite uh, good weaponry, as you can see there. You know, not only plenty of guns, but she had torpedoes as well. She did not have any armour as she was constructed as a commercial vessel. Uh, her top speed was 18 knots and her gun range of 11,000 metres, which is very important to this story. And her weaponry was mainly World War guns, one guns. As you can imagine, the Hilfkreuzers were tail end Charlie when it came to getting uh, modern weaponry. Uh, they were way behind uh, the uh, more modern ships of the German Navy. Her skipper, Theodore Detmers was a very capable and skilled commander. Joined the Navy in 1921 and had various postings and he was in command for the first time in 1938 of the destroyer Hermann Schoeman. And in July 1940, he became captain of Cormoran. Now, what is interesting about a commerce raider is that they are a lone wolf. They're out on their own for prolonged periods of time. So, and you were always on a war footing because you never know what you were going to experience. So it required not only a skillful commander, but also a skilled crew. Uh, their orders were to draw, destroy commerce, but to stay away from allied warships. Uh, Detmers had rigorous gunnery practice and uh, decamouflaging practice every week and a very detailed gun strategy in place. And you can see the auxiliary cruiser war badge down there at the bottom, and you can see it on uh, Theodore Detmer's uh, uniform, which was taken after the war in where he had had a partial stroke. Now, Cormoran up to 1941. She ran the blockade in December 40 to break out into the Atlantic. Once, as I've said, her crew were some of the best of the uh, Kriegsmarine. They had to be capable, they had to be experienced because of the unusual circumstances that surrounded their service. She was seeking targets of opportunity while staying away from the sea lanes because you did not want to encounter um, a convoy uh, escorted by a warship if you were going about your business to sink something. 
She regularly uh, changed her disguise to foreign ships and she also replenished U-boats as well as met with uh, resupply ships such as the Kulmalan and also German naval units such as the Admiral Scheer. And you can see in these photos that she is in the process of re-oiling uh, a submarine. And then on the top left-hand photo, the job's done and she's steaming away. And for the life of me, I cannot imagine why on earth you would be wearing a pith helmet on the conning tower of a submarine, but uh, photos don't lie. Now, she entered the Indian Ocean in April 1941, disguised as a Japanese freighter, Sakito Maru. And what I've put here are the photos showing Cormoran on the left, and you've got Sakito Maru on the right, lots of similarities between the two, very, very similar in fact, and her ultimate disguise when she met Sydney of Strat Malacca on the bottom left. You can see that there's quite significant difference between the stern of Strat Malacca and Cormoran and also the number of Samson posts. Now that disguise into Strat Malacca came in July 1941 after she had spent time in the Bay of Bengal laying mines and also she experienced some engine room problems and needed an overhaul at sea, which took place, but she had been at sea for some time by this stage, six months. She had a lot of marine growth on her hull. Now, she planned to sail south to the coast of Western Australia. Why would be she do that? She wanted to lay mines on the convoy routes up and down the West Australian coast. However, these plans were changed when wireless signals were detected that a convoy was in that area, uh, possibly escorted by HMAS Canberra. So there was a change of plans by Detmers, Detmers and she sailed further north to Shark Bay to lay mines around Shark Bay and then proceed back to the Bay of Bengal to once again lay mines. And up to 1940, up to 19th of November, she had sunk or captured 11 ships at 68,000 tonnes. Now, she was most assuredly a wolf in sheep's clothing. Let's look at her concealed gunnery. Foxel and deck guns hidden behind counterweighted false hull plates. Centerline guns concealed by fake cargo hatches and walls. Five anti-aircraft guns hidden by the ship's super superstructure until raised on hydraulic platforms. 2X Army anti-tank guns installed on the superstructure, hidden behind metal plates. Torpedo tubes hidden behind the hull plates, two below the water lines. And as I've said, she was definitely a wolf in sheep's clothing. So here we have a good uh, starboard side view of Cormoran. You can see the position of her guns with the drop down plates here. And, you know, she's bristling with guns. When you look at all of this, she is a very well armed quite an, a worthy opponent uh, for anyone that she came in contact with, particularly uh, merchant uh, ships where they stood no chance against such a heavily armed ship. Now let's look at our girl. Let's look at HMAS Sydney too. She was laid down in July 1933 as HMS Phaeton at Swan Hunter, Wigram and Richardson in Newcastle. She was a modified Leander class cruiser that came about as a result of the changes and restrictions from the Washington and London treaties and designed by Sir Charles Lillicrap. She was a transverse uh, framed ship. She was launched by the wife of our prime minister, Mrs. Bruce, as HMAS Sydney II in 1935. One of her early COs, uh, Royal Navy Commander Waller, as in opposed to um, Royal Australian Navy Commander Heck Waller, he identified the fact that she had a single director control tower as a weak point. Now, during her construction, it was not long after the depression, there had been cost overruns in HMS Leander. And so a, se a separate director control tower was not included to save the princely sum of 22,317 pounds. But she did have a significant number of redundant and separated systems. In 1936, she joined the Royal Navy Mediterranean Fleet, spent some time off the coast of Africa in the Abyssinian crisis, and in July 36, departed for home, where she stayed in home waters until after the outbreak of war, where she joined the Royal Navy Mediterranean uh, Cruiser, 7th Cruiser Squadron, under command of Admiral Cunningham. She had been 
designed, uh, designated to go to the Red Sea, but Cunningham decided to keep her for himself after he saw the excellent performance of the Australian destroyer, destroyer crop squadrons in the war zone at that time. And if you look at that photograph of Sydney, she was indeed a very handsome, good looking ship. Here are her specifications. She's well armed. She's got armor over her machinery and magazine spaces, uh, one inch hull plating. And look at her speed. She's got 32.5 knots. And she has a gun range of twice that of Cormoran, 22,700 metres, and she has Azdex. So she's a pretty good uh, all-around warship. Let's look at her uh, detail of her weapons here. You can see A and B six-inch turrets, her bridge, her director control tower, and her high-angle control tower. Now, we know that the director control tower was uh, very important in the angle um, to and distance to targets, transmitting information to the guns. Uh, she had her Walrus or Seagull 5 aircraft folded here on a catapult. She had her torpedoes and she had X and Y turrets and four inch guns on both sides. You can see here the four inch gun crew has very little protection against incoming fire. It was scheduled to be changed at some point, but had not been done at the time that she met Cormoran. On the left, we've got her six inch guns, A and B turret, barrel scorched after an action. And down below, you can see her walrus aircraft on the catapult ready to be um, sent off for reconnaissance. And you can see her, tor her torpedoes here. Now, her wartime actions. She was part of the squadron that sank the Italian destroyer Aspiro. And also she's probably most famously remembered for the action at Cape Sparta where she sank the Italian cruiser Bartolomeo Colleoni. Now, all through her actions in the Mediterranean, she had minimal damage and no casualties. When she came back into Alexandria Harbour, there were cheers and whistles from everybody in the harbour. Her escorting destroyers stood aside to let her into the harbour ahead of everybody else. And even Heck Waller sent her a signal, wacko Sydney. Everybody was filled with joy and jubilation. Uh, she had a large shell hole in her funnel. And as Captain Collins later described, it was the sort of damage that you want to have. Looks impressive, but no one was killed. She had been subjected to constant and numerous air attacks during her career in the Mediterranean, none of which uh, impacted her at all. She won battle honours for Calabria and Cape Sparta. So she had this mystery about her. She was called the lucky ship, the glamour ship, because of her excellent uh, re reputation in the Mediterranean. And indeed, Admiral Cunningham said, even though she's a British designed ship, she has an Australian CO and an Australian predominantly, a predominantly Australian crew. She is very much an Australian concern. She took part in the bombardment of Scan Scarpanto Island in September, 1940. This was to take place in dawn. And in order to uh, disguise her as a Condottieri class uh, cruiser, uh, Collins erected fake canvas um, screens to change her outline in the half light of dawn. This was a successful raid along with British destroyers. And when the raid was completed, he radioed Admiral Cunningham the results and Cunningham came back, Sydney, you are our stormy petrel. And she was awarded the 1940 Mediterranean Fleet Battle Honour. Here she is returning to Alexandria Harbour. Look at the jubilation of the people on the wharf. The uh, Australian flag was flying proudly from her mast and there was a lot of emotion and jubilation. And you can see the holes and the damage to her funnel. And her deployment was classified as the most successful deployment in RAN history. So what happens next? She needs a refit and some crew leave. So she returns to home waters and predominantly to protect Australia from enemy ships because there had been some ships lost as a result of what was considered to be raider action. There was jubilation in Sydney at her return. Flags were flown throughout the city. There was a freedom of entry of the city march on the 11th of March where 300,000 people lined the streets waving flags and cheering. But Captain Collins said, we are to hold our heads and march as Navy men, no waving. And they walked, they marched as a great unit. And indeed, at one point, 
Collins had to stop the march to disentangle himself from streamers. All state school children were given a day off and there was a civic reception where medals were given out to those crew who had been on the ship at the Battle of Cape Sparta. These medals uh, were created into large plates and you can see on the top right hand photo there that uh, Captain Collins is making a speech of thank you. These became known as the Sparta plates. And interestingly enough, they were recreated and they are now in the conference room of HMAS Sydney 5. So what does she do in Australia? She comes to escort with convoys around the coast. Famously, she escorted the two Queens, uh, uh, which you can see on the top right hand photo, Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. She had a change of command to jab Joseph Burnett in May 1941. And then she was scheduled to escort troop ship Zelandia from Me Fremantle, but her departure was delayed during the time because of industrial action. And you can see the photo of Zelandia at the bottom. She was taking troops to go up to Singapore who unfortunately were taken prisoner with the fall of Singapore shortly afterwards. And I like that painting, Farewell Sydney by Daryl White, showing her leave, leaving Fremantle for what we now know was the last time. Let's look at Captain Burnett, a very capable officer. His father died when he was seven. Interesting parallel with his own children. Royal Naval College, first intake in December 1912, a very good all round sportsman, had a number of postings, gunnery officer in 1924, XO of Battleship Royal Oak. He, 1934, he worked in the Navy head office for Melbourne for two years, where he had experience in the plot area where they would gather uh, intelligence and notify ships the, about the whereabouts of vessels in their area. So he knew uh, the pros and cons of that process. In 36, he was executive officer of HMAS Canberra, 38, promoted to captain. 1940, deputy chief of naval staff. And he was our senior representative at the Allied Conference for Defence of the Asia Pacific region. He was a talented, well-respected officer, well thought of by his peers and respected by the lower deck aboard Sydney and he became captain in May 1941 in what was to be his first direct command. So prior to the ship seeking exciting each other, what's the lead up? On the 6th of October, there's a weekly summer, summary stating that a raider is thought to be in, Pacific, in the Pacific. Raider G was actually Cormoran's uh, identification by the Naval Board in Australia, but she was not in the Pacific as we know. She was over on the other side in the Indian Ocean. On the 20th of October, they now say that the radar is in the Indian Ocean and they give a partial description of her, but not her stern. So what are the scenarios that is facing uh, Captain Burnett? You've got to identify friend or foe, which Bob Trotter spoke about previously. On the 4th of November, the Admiralty sends out message 771A, signals and procedures to prevent scuttling of enemy ships, very detailed procedures. On the 11th of November, she makes her final departure from Fremantle, escorting Zealandia, and she hands her over to HMS Durban in the Sunda Strait on the 17th of November, and then she turns and heads for home on the Cape Lewin, Sunda Strait track. Uh, Sydney is maintaining radio silence. This is wartime. Uh, she's scheduled to return to Fremantle on November the 20th. And at a quarter to four in the afternoon of the 19th, both ships sight each other. Cormoran has a lookout high up on the ship and uh, immediately reports he's seeing two masts on her horizon. And uh, advises Dietmers that uh, it's probably a sailing ship. As they close though, however, it turns out to be not uh, a sailing ship at all. Uh, the Zen smoke, uh, they then think it's a convoy being escorted by Navy ships, but as it gets closer, it's clearly a ship of the Grey Funnel line. Uh, and, uh, and Dietmers knows about the light cruiser. He'd actually been on one before. Uh, so it's now identified uh, as a, a Navy ship and the Dietmers immediately instructs uh, the Cormoran to turn to port into the sun so it's difficult to see the ship and uh, takes the Cormoran, uh, orders the Cormoran to action stations. Sydney uh, quickly increases speed to close the distance between the two, but it's going to be extraordinarily difficult to identify the Cormoran 
uh, and, and challenge it. Uh, they're looking straight into the sun, the glare from the water. There's a sea haze, uh, and we'll see what happens later with the signaling between the ships. Typically, uh, when Burnett encountered merchant ships before, he's, uh, what he had done before was approach from the stern and put Sydney at action stations. Sydney could be at action stations at this point, we'll never know. This is a, a diagram. You can see here, here's Sydney coming down on his track to Fremantle. This is the point where the two ships sight each other. Here's the Cormoran coming up here. It immediately turns to port and uh, Sydney gives chase down here. And here at 5.30, uh, this is where the battle takes place. Sydney turns to port and uh, you can see the sinking positions of the two ships. Uh, so that's a, a general diagram of the courses of the two ships. We'll look at this in a, in a lot more detail later. So as you've heard from uh, Gillian, there's lots of ambiguous Admiralty uh, instructions. Uh, it's not uh, very clear. Uh, they know there's a raider in the Indian Ocean, uh, but they also know the intelligence isn't always accurate. And they're well aware what Farcombe did, Farcombe did on the Canberra, uh, fired 200 shells uh, and got severely criticized by the Admiralty for doing so. And uh, then now uh, it's, uh, they need to close and identify this ship before it becomes dark. Uh, and they're well aware that merchant ships are in short supply. A lot of them have been sunk. So uh, capturing a merchant ship and taking it as a prize is something that will really be appreciated. The discussion on board the Cormoran. They know they can't outrun or outshoot uh, a light cruiser. And uh, their options uh, generally uh, they talk about is, well, we'll either be sunk uh, by the ship or we need to scuttle our own ship. Quickly, Forster, an officer on, on, on the bridge says, we can only die once. So they're ready to die in this situation. As uh, Sydney is closing, they just hope it'll lose interest and resume the course. One of their four engines is out of action and uh, marine growth. So they're down to 14 knots as fast as they can do. And their only hope is to get Sydney within gun range. Uh, the flags are hoisted slowly. The instructions are make this look like a greenhorn. Merchant ships were typically fairly poor at uh, handling flags. So they're slowing this whole thing down with uh, unusual uh, uh, hoisting of flags uh, and hoping that they can draw Sydney in uh, and realize uh, once they get Sydney in, they have uh, only one advantage and that is surprise. They've got a gun strategy in place uh, in the case if they have to do a battle with a warship. Here's the gun strategy. You can see clearly they very quickly want to do damage to the gun turrets, most importantly to the bridge. You can see a six inch gun, the anti-tank gun and a, uh, a machine gun is aimed at the bridge. So there's really serious about uh, taking command and control out uh, the plane, the rear turrets. And they're also uh, going to put machine gun fire uh, onto the, the deck where the four inch guns and the torpedoes are. So they hope they can, can with that fire, they can stop those uh, guns and the torpedoes being manned. So they really have quite a clever plan to very quickly uh, disable Sydney. So Sydney closes and uh, signals uh, in NJ, which is uh, make the signals clear. Cormoran uh, doesn't understand. Then they signal what ship. Uh, Cormoran signals back Strat Malacca. They look up their plot. It's not on the plot. They're, uh, they're not expecting any ships uh, in the area at this time. Then the Cormoran sends out a strange signal, QQ, QQ. This uh, at uh, two minute intervals. And this is uh, an unusual signal as we'll see in a moment. Then Sydney signals we're bound, uh, Batavia, what cargo, peace goods. And then Sydney hoists the OK and then asks um, uh, <clears throat> the Cormoran to uh, give them their secret identification code. But uh, Dietmar's, uh, the secret code is IIKP. What you do is put up uh, IK and if this, if the other ship should reply with IP. Dietmar turns to his officer and says, we do have, do we have this? And the answer is no. They are now in a very difficult situation. 
Now, the reason the QQQ is a bit unusual because it's a British signal when you're being uh, pursued by an armed merchant raider. If they were going to send any signal, it should have been RRR, which is when attacked by an enemy warship. So if we go on board Sydney now, what would have been the discussion? We've got all these admiralty instructions, uh, one of which says, uh, look, uh, to, you really need to have a boarding party if at all possible to positively identify the ship. Uh, destroy fire high, destroy the lifeboats. Uh, that'll discourage uh, them from scuttling the ship. And you can't just attack an arbitrary sink something without identifying it. And uh, the diagram of the Strat Malarca, which they've got in their merchant ships book, shows the difference uh, in Samson posts between Cormoran and Strat Malarca. They're now closing to 8,000 metres. This uh, is not uh, consistent with the Admiralty instructions. And they also uh, recall to think about firing high. Uh, all of the raiders and the raider supply ships had taken prisoners of war from the ships that they'd sunk. And uh, it's better to fire high than into the hull where you may kill the prisoner of wars. And uh, they think about it may be a raider supply ship. If it is, we need the launch and to find the raider. And uh, the initial assessment uh, of Cormoran here could be friendly. The warning signals. First of all, uh, the uh, the lookout high up uh, on the cormoran, the turn away, the list of Strat Malacca not being there, the difference in Sampson's post, and the sending of the signal. Uh, that all of this was uh, somewhat unusual and uh, should have caught everyone's attention. Now, on board the Cormoran, uh, they're very well aware. One shell onto the uh, 300 plus mines on the after uh, hulls, uh, the explosion, that will be the end of the ship and everyone on board. Uh, Measure Smith is up high uh, in the ship and he's giving bearings to the guns that are all camouflaged at this point in time. So, as soon as they decamouflage, they're going to be almost, uh, they're going to be on the target uh, or close to the target very quickly. Uh, but they're all well aware we're not supposed to do this. German high command orders are to avoid armed clashes. But by the way, if you have to do it, you can do it by means of camouflage, unexpected and uh, ruthless use of weapons. So that's, uh, they're not supposed to be doing this, but they have no option. The ships eventually draw beam onto each other at a thousand plus yards. In Navy terms, this is point blank range. The uh, plane on the Sydney has swung out as if to be launched, uh, uh, started, then shut down and brought back. Uh, now, Sydney does have it is action stations and has its guns and torpedoes trained on the Corman. And Deepman now makes the fateful decision. Uh, the only option is to fight and will use the element of surprise. So quickly instructs the Dutch flag that's been flying to replace with the German battle ensign, which you can see below, and immediately uh, decamouflage and fire free according to their gun strategy. They can do this in less than 10 seconds. There are some reports of doing it in six seconds and the Cormoran's crew know they're fighting for their lives now. Let's think about what's happening here on both the ships. Uh, when the guns are fired, uh, there's typically a, a, a huge blast. Uh, the ship's rocked by the concussion, a blinding flash, lots of smoke, and in some cases, ships uh, were damaged uh, by firing their own guns. In an incoming shell, you've got a loud streaming noise, then the explosion and the consequent fire. You've got lots of shrapnel and shards of steel. And uh, from the fire, you're going to have smoke, maybe some toxic gases requiring gas masks. And uh, water line hits are going to bring in water. And uh, if you're trying to put out a fire and there's some shell holes in that area, it's going to keep burning uh, due to the oxygen being brought in through the shell hole. Here's just a, an illustration uh, of the flame and smoke, uh, the mighty USS Missouri firing a, a broadside. And down below, we have a very similar, on a smaller scale, Sydney uh, firing uh, with the smoke. If you're inside at this point in time and a shell explosion, uh, the shrapnel and shards of steel, uh, this is what it does to the metal uh, infrastructure inside a ship. You would not want to be 
in this area when the shell exploded. A torpedo hit, uh, we're just doing this to think about what happened uh, here. Uh, there's lots of explosives, uh, explosive in the torpedo, the head of the torpedo. It's going to possibly create a fire. Uh, water's going to flood in, the ship may list. Certainly that part of the sink, the ship is going to sink lower in the water. Bulkheads are probably damaged, electrical circuits, communication may be disrupted, and the <clears throat> consequent damage uh, may block uh, access to, to that part of the ship. And uh, worst of all, the fire main that's going to give you firefighting uh, capability uh, may be damaged from the hit. Here we've got a ship, uh, just to illustrate, uh, a torpedo hit on a ship. And down below, we've got our own Torrens, uh, which has uh, been hit by a torpedo to send it as a dive wreck. You can see it's clearly bro broken in two uh, from the enormous explosion of the torpedo. Here's the USS Canberra to give you, we just have a look at a couple more so that you get some feel for the impact of a torpedo. That's inside, uh, you can see the massive damage and uh, uh, to the structure inside a ship. It's not uncommon for a hundred plus uh, sailors uh, to be killed uh, in a torpedo hit. And here we're back with the strategy. Uh, so it's all ready to go uh, as soon as the camouflage, that's the gun strategy in place. Both ships open fire almost simultaneously. Uh, Sydney's first eight inch gun salvo go over the corner. They're firing high. One of the uh, shells goes through the, the funnel of the cormoran. The cormoran is a merchant ship had uh, tubes carrying oil in their funnel. They're using the heat uh, uh, to warm up the fuel, which is, makes it more efficient. And uh, that's ruptured. So now they've got burning fuel going down into the engine room. But very quickly, Cormoran's anti-tank guns hits the Sydney Bridge. Uh, and then very quickly, the Cormoran six inch guns uh, fire ranging shots. The uh, machine gun is keeping, uh, stopping the four inch guns and the torpedoes on Sydney being manned. And then uh, the six inch guns take out the gun director and the plane on board uh, Sydney. And of course, uh, with the plane being hit, you've got a uh, fuel burning and you've got uh, a very large fire. Then uh, Cormoran uh, start to hit at the waterline, uh, keep firing constantly uh, uh, to hit uh, Sydney at the waterline. keeps up firing, then A and B turrets are hit. They only fire the initial salvo. They never fire again. Uh, then Cormoran fires two torpedoes. One hits the bows and uh, X and Y turret with the directors gone, they go into local control and X turret starts to fire some very accurate shots. The painting down below, you can see the torpedo strike, the top of one of the turrets uh, being blown off, the plane in midships there on fire and you can see the X turret uh, returning fire. Cormoran's engine room uh, is now on fire. The fire extinguisher system has also been hit. So they really uh, are in a very difficult situation of putting this out. And then X turret uh, hits the main electrical system. You may recall, this is a diesel engine, uh, electric motor powered ship. Uh, so with that electrical system gone, they have lost power as well. Sydney now turns to port. Nobody uh, will ever know whether to ram the Cormoran or just to avoid torpedoes. Sydney fires its torpedoes, they miss. And now Sydney uh, uh, is uh, taking a lot of hits on its starboard side. Uh, deepness with what uh, way underway he's got uh, turns the Cormoran so that all of the guns on the port side of the Cormoran uh, can start hitting uh, Sydney on its starboard side. Here's uh, where things, uh, this is what they were aiming at. Here's the bridge here. Here's the two gun directors. Uh, that's what they took out very quickly. Then uh, the battle continues. The turrets are hit again. Uh, uh, X and Y turret are jammed. So literally Sydney cannot return fire at this time. And the Cormoran just continues. As you can see uh, a total of 400 shells. They're firing so rapidly that they have to bring out fire hoses to cool down the gun barrels. They then have to abandon the engine room. It can't make any contact with it. And they keep firing for another hour, 625. 
and now Sydney is just a burning hulk uh, on fire, slowly heading southeast. Then at uh, 10 o'clock, uh, the glow in the sky from the Sydney uh, stops, and uh, you can probably assume it sinks at that point. And then 35 minutes uh, uh, past uh, midnight, uh, the cormoran with the scuttling charges and the mines uh, explodes. Uh, the ship is literally blown uh, into two. The stern section is almost nothing left except scrap metal. Now, uh, once the ship is found, uh, uh, scientists and marine engineers quickly look at all of the photos and they model and simulate what might have happened uh, on Sydney. They estimate 70% of the crew were killed or seriously wounded uh, in, uh, during this time, and something like 200,000 fragments uh, from 87 identified uh, shell impacts uh, on the ship. And uh, it's a really rough sea uh, by this time at night, ship moving slowly. It's probably unlikely that there's any life-saving equipment left. It would have been destroyed in the battle, and there's not enough people to uh, uh, to do the medical work required or fire and damage control or shore up bulkheads. There's just not enough of the crew to do any of that. And if they've lost electrical power for the pumps with all the water coming in, uh, it's going to flood uh, quite a lot. And they estimate the bow would be down by three metres as a result of the torpedo hit. That is going to bring the shell holes that were above at the waterline, below the waterline, so there's a lot of water pouring into this ship and it's rolling, which is going to uh, influence uh, what happens here. Did it lose buoyancy and sink? Did the bow break off? There are different opinions. The simulation shows that the bow was still on uh, when it sank. It just lost buoyancy, the lost the ability to float uh, and the bow breaks off uh, as it sinks. But whatever happens here, it happens very quickly and uh, not a lot of uh, time to do it for the crew to escape. Here's a uh, photo uh, of the ship uh, rolling up to 40 degrees. This is an artist's impression uh, on fire, uh, barely underway. On board the Cormoran now. The fire, they're in desperate straits. The fire's heading towards the mines. The engine room uh, is just uh, lost and uh, they have no electrical power. They need winches. The lifeboats are large, heavy steel uh, lifeboats, and uh, they're in great difficulty trying to launch these. They put all the wounded uh, in the boats. Then when they uh, put one, drop one boat in, uh, they haven't set it up properly, and 60 men drown. Uh, and now they're setting scuttling charges. Deepman's being the captain he is, is the last to leave. And then, as I mentioned before, it all... Uh, happens at 35 minutes. They, in total, they lose 82 of their sailors. The option's not taken uh, by Burnett. Uh, stay out of gun range and request the Cormoran to stop. If it doesn't stop, uh, uh, you can legitimately uh, open fire. Uh, check where the strike malacca it was. It was uh, uh, off the coast of Africa. Use the plane to have a look at Cormoran or continue the approach uh, from the stern. Options not taken. Let's have a final look at the timeline. It only took the battle starts at uh, 5.30. By 5.32, uh, Sydney has lost its capability to fight uh, and has also been hit by a torpedo. So within a few minutes, both ships are mortally wounded and uh, Cormoran continues to fire for another hour. Both ships uh, get battle honours. Uh, Dietmers has awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron's Cross. This is the highest award uh, that you can get in the uh, German military, uh, similar to our Victoria Cross, which is how the highest award. And you can see the Battle Honours Board uh, for the Sydney. It uh, has the Cormoran 1941 there amongst all of the other uh, battles that uh, it was involved in. The initial search, uh, they kept radio silence for three days, and but finally uh, on the 23rd, radio silence was broken, and they're asking Sydney to report her position. As you can imagine, they don't get a reply. Then uh, quite a, a huge search is done by air and sea, but the only thing that's recovered is two life belts and an empty Carly float uh, 
no bodies or survivors are found from both ships. So what was the impact on the nation and the Royal Australian Navy of the loss of Sydney? On the 1st of December, 1941, John C Curtin, the PM, made the terrible announcement. For the Royal Navy, this was a brutal blow. They lost one of her, their cruisers and also a ship that had uh, brought a great degree of pride and uh, respect to the Royal Australian Navy. Newspapers published the list of all 645 names uh, outlined in black. So the names were there for everybody to see. Families were in shock, as was the rest of the nation. How could the lucky ship, the Stormy Petrel, the Grey Gladiator, this mythic ship with this mythical luck, be snuffed out in one battle and every man lost. It was just something that people could not believe. And the citizens of Sydney took the news particularly hard because only seven months before they had cheered the crew through the streets. And there was not only terrible shock at the announcement, but disbelief at the German accounts because there was no account from uh, the Sydney, there was no survivors. And, uh, you know, when there's nothing much coming from the government, you then start to get conspiracy theories coming to the fore because the government was reasonably silent at that point about what had happened. So what was the impact on crew families? Apart from the initial shock, many hoped that their men could have been a survivor. Maybe they were prisoner of war. Uh, Tokyo Rose indeed uh, made a broadcast to say that the men from Sydney had been taken POWs and this gave some hope to the women and, and families left behind. The dreaded telegrams arrived at the houses of the Sydney crew on the 26th of November. Uh, these are a stark uh, bringing together of the fact that your loved one is missing. As time went on, Hopes were dashed of ever finding uh, the crew. And, you know, you have then the impact in the family of the loss of the future for these men. They were only 20 years, average was 21 years of age. So they had no opportunity to become uh, partners, husbands, uncles, uh, fathers, um, go on with their lives, make a life, uh, be successful. All of those futures were taken away from the parents of the families remaining. But the worst thing must have been not knowing how they died. Similar to the circumstance of the family of the crew members of AE-1, the Australian Navy submarine that was lost with all hands off New Guinea in, nine, in World War I. When someone dies, you would normally have a funeral. So there's a process where you go through planning it to you have the grieving process, you're surrounded by family and friends, uh, there's either a a, a burial or a cremation and that's a finality of sorts but there was no such thing for the men of the Sydney there were too many unanswered questions for the women particularly it was terribly hard how will I support my children how will I put a roof over my head what has happened to my partner my husband my and my son for mothers the terrible hardships that were imposed on women then because you couldn't get a home loan uh, most of them would have been uh, stay at home, either mothers or wives. And you could get the uh, repatriation pension. But at that time, if you were deemed to be of an unsuitable character, that pension could be taken away from you. Why were there no survivors? This was the burning question. David Mearns made this statement in 1994. Losing someone at sea in this way is the worst kind of bereavement because there is no body to bury. Families can't even find comfort in the busy work of organising a funeral. They are left in a hellish limbo until the last remaining hope of survivors being found is completely exhausted. Some never come to terms with their loss and forever hope that a knock at their front door will be followed by the loved one walking home walking back in and isn't that the truth? So this is the terrible telegram that my grandparents were faced with. They had been, the family had been visiting grandpa in hospital. He was a fireman in a, a merchant ship and he had lost part of a finger and they came home and one of the younger family members had been at home when the dreaded telegram had been arrived. So my lovely uncle was only 20 
when he was lost on Sydney. He was a gun layer, maybe four inch, maybe six inch guns. I don't know. But grandma, after the, after the war, wore her mother's and widow's badge with pride, with the star underneath indicating that she had lost um, her son uh, to the war. But it's a badge that nobody would want to wear um, unless they were absolutely forced to. This is what 645 men look like, all lost on that fateful night. Uh, this was taken just not long after the Battle of Cape Sparta. So the questions that needed answering were these. How on earth could a well-armed warship be sunk by an armed merchant cruiser? It just did, did not seem possible. Sydney on paper, of course, was a far superior ship. However, she had not been in a war footing for more than 17 months. She was mostly doing escort work compared to the combat uh, readiness of Cormoran. Why did Sydney get so close to, to Cormoran? This was the burning issue. Conspiracy theories in lieu of correct information about enemy submarines, uh, uh, sub you know, machine gunning the survivors in the water. All of these conspiracy theories started to come forward because there was no substantive evidence from anyone uh, on the Australian side. Why were there 318 German survivors and not one survivor from Sydney? No body, no wreckage. There are some detailed um, information on why there would have been no bodies by the time the search was started. We won't go into that here. Uh, but the families and the nation wanted answers to these and other questions. Well, with those unanswered questions, uh, the Sydney has to be found. And uh, somebody's going to have to step up to do this job. Uh, people had tried before. Uh, but there are a lot of people saying it'll never be done. You're wasting your time. Uh, you'll never find it. So the people who had to step up to do this job were the Finding Sydney Foundation and, uh, eventually, and eventually with David Mearns. There were some early searches. You can imagine it's of great interest to find this ship. Uh, information released by the government to help them. A lot of people published books here, a number of books written, everyone with their own idea of what happened and where the ship is. Uh, huge areas uh, were suggested. There were some searches by Navy and oil companies, and they were using all sorts of technologies. Uh, there was a technology for, used from a plane, uh, but they're very basic technologies at this uh, point in time. Then uh, there are a number of early organizations. People uh, banded together to get this job done, find the Sydney. Uh, but there's disagreement as to where the ship is, what to do. Uh, and of course, if your objective is to find a ship and uh, the people that you're working with can't agree on where it is and how to do it, uh, they're not going to last for long. So they're typically formed and dissolved in the 90s. This is uh, just a diagram to illustrate people's various views on where the ship is or where to search. Uh, they're huge areas uh, and it's not practical uh, to go and look in, in some of these areas, they're so big. Then there's a 50th anniversary forum. This is all about finding the Sydney. Once again, everyone's got a different view of where the ship is and what to do. Parliamentary inquiry. Then there's a Sydney location seminar. This is all about finding the Sydney and everyone is in uh, is lots of disagreement and the government uh, and the Navy are not going to get behind it. Uh, there's too, uh, too many different ideas and uh, where, to, where to look. Then the Finding Sydney Foundation uh, takes this on. These, uh, this group of people are uh, quite extraordinary. In 2014, with the science and technology that they're using, they come up with where they think the Cormoran is based on all the German accounts and lots of uh, uh, technology and science. And it turns out they're only a little over two nautical miles from where the ship is found. An extraordinary achievement to use science and technology uh, to do that. So what they did was took, took a very simple view. Everyone before this is looking for Sydney, where is the Sydney? Uh, but the Finding Sydney Foundation say, look, let's trust the Germans. They're professional sailors. They surely, uh, the, the information is all consistent. Let's take that information 
and let's do something different. Let's find the cormoran. And then if we really trusted their information, once we found the cormoran, we need to go southeast uh, and uh, for a few nautical miles, uh, and we should probably find the Sydney. And uh, <clears throat> that's uh, how they did it. The technology was now available and only $75,000 a day a year to do it. So what enabled the ship to be found? The passion, commitment and persistence of everyone involved and some extraordinary detective work, which we'll have a look at and some very sophisticated science and technology. And they then set themselves uh, an enormous challenge. Uh, we should find it in the lifetimes of the widows, sons, daughters, friends and mates. Uh, so that <coughs> there'll be some closure. Well, how did it get funded? The government initially came up with 1.3 million. They need 5 million. And the government also proposes a quite a complex uh, contract with the Finding Sydney uh, Foundation. Then, of course, the Western Australian government kicks in with half a million. New South Wales kicks in with a quarter of a million. And then uh, the government finally says, well, if you need 5 million, we'll kick in a, a 2.9 in addition. And uh, there's a consultancy agreement. Uh, everyone's happy that if the Finding Sydney Foundation and MERNs uh, team up uh, with all the work the Finding Sydney Foundation have done and MERNs experience as a wreck hunter, search director, uh, and put it under the control. So all's looking good here. A summary of where the money came from, the thing that stands out here uh, is business, 200,000. It would appear that the attitude of uh, businesses and corporations at this point in time to the government is this is your ship, uh, you should be paying the bloody money to find it. Uh, so they didn't uh, really put in a lot and it's only going to allow 30 days at sea, the other $5 million. Now, Moons and the Finding Sydney Foundation came up with search areas, they overlap and eventually uh, they become almost close the same. Uh, so they came up independently and once everyone saw that there was overlap, they're, they're quite uh, close to each other. Uh, everyone is quite confident uh, that uh, the, the job will be done this time. Now, the first person, the two uh, Prominent to deep sea searches uh, at this point in time are Bob Ballard and David Burns. Bob Ballard has discovered the Titanic and the Bismarck. Now, the Titanic uh, was issuing SOSs with its uh, position, so it, you, everyone knew where the Titanic was. It was just uh, down very deep. And the Bismarck, of course, uh, half the British Navy were recording uh, where the Bismarck uh, went down. Uh, and uh, he was quite confident. You tell me where your haystack is and I'll find a ship in it. Uh, but when uh, he thought there were more than one haystack, uh, he lost interest. David Mearns has always uh, been interested in finding the Sydney. Uh, he found the hood. Uh, once again, the German, the British and the German ships uh, had a very good idea where that was. Uh, but the Derbyshire and the other ones there uh, were a real search uh, to find. And he comes up with a... Uh, they finally agree on a search box for the Cormoran, 1,800 square nautical miles. Note the Titanic uh, uh, search box was only 150 uh, square nautical miles. And they're now confident once they find the Cormoran that they can find the Sydney in a much uh, smaller search box. So what was the detective work by the Finding Sydney Foundation? Cognitive science, mathematics, experts in oceanography, experts in search and rescue, I did marine rescue uh, for a few years. Uh, when you get the position of the uh, ship that needs, the boat that needs rescuing, uh, uh, and it's gonna take you hours to get out there, you need to uh, think about the breeze conditions, uh, the currents, et cetera, because the boat isn't going to be uh, where it reported the, the problem, it's gonna be somewhere else. And they do extraordinary uh, work from where the lifeboats, some of the lifeboats were picked up by ships, some landed on the coast, and the, with the time when it was launched, the time it arrived, and the search conditions, uh, uh, they can figure out, well, if it arrived here at this time, and it was put in the water at this time, given the sea state, uh, the breeze, the ocean currents, we think this is uh, the position of where it was launched. So they uh, do an enormous uh, amount of detective work here. 
Moon's uh, is does something a little different. He believes that if you look at the primary source documents, which were done close to where it happened, we all know our memory can play tricks. So he wants to look at what was documented as close to the time that this happened. Uh, and that's what he focuses on. He's spending a year uh, doing research and scientific analysis for this, goes to London uh, and finds a, a box of uncatalogued material. When the uh, crew of the Cormoran uh, finally repatriated to Germany, all of the documents that they have on board them are confiscated and are in this box. There are reports of the action. Uh, he then goes to Germany. Uh, uh, Dietmar's recorded in code in a dictionary uh, and his nephew has got this. Uh, so uh, he has access to, to this uh, action report from Dietmar's in the dictionary. And he goes to Chile uh, where the radio operator lives uh, who sent out the QQQ uh, signals and he wants to know how, and they sent out the position of the ship, how he knew the position of the ship in the radio. So he's uh, got a, a, a lot of uh, information here, uh, which helps the search. All right, getting to sea. Uh, once the government's uh, put in all the money, then the chief of Navy says, look, I'm happy uh, if you put the Sydney, Sydney Finding Sydney Foundation and David Mearns together. Uh, and then finally, John Howard simplifies the contract uh, and uh, has the Navy as contract manager. So it's all systems go at this point. There's the geosounder, the ship that goes out uh, for the search. The, the uh, people that are on board are David Mearns, the search director, Dennis McDonald from the Finding Sydney Foundation, Perryman from the Navy, uh, Michael McCarthy, uh, from the Western Australian Maritime Museum who were closely involved in that. Here's uh, the sonar, the picture on the right, uh, the black uh, tubes either side is the actual uh, sonar. So when that's launched, it can, it can look at the C4 three kilometers either side. So as it's towed, you're looking at a six kilometer wide uh, path Immediately underneath it, there is a dead spot. So if you actually pass over a wreck, you're not going to see it. This diagram is not to scale. A ship can only do uh, two and a half knots. That cable is 10 kilometers long. Uh, the, the tow sled is kilometers behind the ship and it has to be significantly hundreds of meters above the sea floor. You, nobody knows what the C4 looks like at this point in time. There could be mountain ranges there. You could have a collision between that. Uh, of course, the Indian Ocean is much better mapped now after the search for MH370. Uh, <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's towed very slowly. You can imagine uh, doing a line search. Uh, to turn this ship round, you have to bring that cable in, turn the ship slowly. It takes hours to turn the ship and come back on another uh, track line to uh, search another part of the ocean. And uh, here it is, March the 12th, it's found 2,560 uh, 2, meters, 112 nautical miles. Here's what they see on the sonar. You can see the black uh, things all around it. The cormoran uh, is blown into many pieces, the stern section particularly. So that's what they see on the sonar and that's what they identify as the cormorant. Here's some photos from the cormorant. That's the flap over the torpedo tubes. <clears throat> Here's uh, one of the six inch guns. They're not like uh, Sydney's guns. They're not in turrets. Uh, they literally uh, have very little protection for the crew, uh, but uh, they were camouflaged. Here's uh, Linda, a little bit of a personal touch. Uh, uh, the rough in translation is uh, uh, victory to us, death to the enemy uh, type thing. And uh, here's another photo uh, of the uh, 20 millimeter gun that can uh, rapid fire, that, which was on the hydraulic mounts. They uh, had uh, on a bulkhead uh, the, uh, the names of the ships, uh, the 11 ships that they'd sunk in their tonnage, uh, their victory list. And here's Sydney found. Four days later, I can always easily remember the depth that it's in, 2468 metres. 
for some of you saw this was all recorded on video uh, uh, the it's a, a very emotional moment uh, uh, for everyone on board uh, when they see uh, uh, the sonar picture here it is uh, you can see uh, that's the dead spot under the sonar so you know if it was there they may not have found it uh, uh, an experienced sonar operator uh, that can scale that up so that they know how long that is. And looking at the shadow of the sonar, uh, they can think about the superstructure. Merns had a huge photo of Sydney in front of him so he could memorize uh, what the superstructure looked like, its height uh, and its various locations. So they're confident when they see this, they've got the Sydney. Now here's the debris field. Uh, when a ship sinks, it's under enormous uh, experiences, forces uh, never designed into it. You can imagine the speed at which it goes to the bottom, the funnels are going to be torn off. And here we have, uh, this is the main hull uh, of the ship and half a kilometer way up here is the bow. I won't go into any more detail. All you need to see here is there are bits and pieces over quite a wide area. Uh, some would have been severely damaged and loosely attached to the ship that are torn off. Uh, so lots of stuff in, in the debris field. Now, uh, the ship needs to be reconfigured. Uh, all of the equipment uh, for the sonar needs to be taken off and uh, a different set of equipment uh, put for the next phase of the operation. So what better to do uh, in Geraldton than to, to go to the memorial? Here they are inside uh, the memorial, uh, the front page of the paper, peace at last, and uh, it, they're waiting for the two weeks to go back out uh, in the ship to do uh, uh, take all the uh, pictures and videos. Here's uh, what's going to happen now. This is the uh, remote operated vehicle. Uh, the mechanism that can swim out of that cage uh, and can go around the ship. Uh, it's going to take uh, photos, enormous number of photos and, and video. It's got lights to, to light to the dark ocean up. Uh, and there are a lot of uh, restrictions. Uh, it can't go close to the ship. It can't go inside it. Uh, so there's a lot of rules and regulations because after all, this is a wreck site and, and a grave site. Uh, later in 2015, another expedition went out using different equipment and created this 3D image uh, of the Sydney uh, courtesy the museum once again and Curtin University uh, spending lots and lots of hours of computer time to produce this. Here we have some photos of the before and after if you like. Uh, here's uh, the bridge, the six inch gun director and the uh, control for the four inch guns. This is the six inch gun director. You can see it almost uh, upside down. Uh, the damage it was so severe that as it sank, it was swept off uh, the Sydney. Here's some other shots. The top ones are the gun director. You can see the gun director has been torn off its mountings and the, the four inch uh, gun control system. You can see it's taken a shell uh, in the structure that holds it uh, and completely uh, blown apart. It's also uh, at a distance. Here's B Tarrant. Uh, it's uh, taken some direct hits. It's literally blown apart. Uh, you can see the two gun barrels and that's about all that's left uh, of B turret. Here's A turret, uh, once again, a direct hit, uh, half the top uh, blown off uh, A turret. All the men in there would uh, have no chance. Here's X turret, the one that did all of the damage. Uh, once the director's lost, the guns uh, can go into local control. Local control means you open that flap up you visually uh, see what you want to hit and set the gun up uh, to aim uh, and fire. Uh, so here's X turret. Here's the four inch guns. Uh, you can see they're still pointing as if uh, they're trying to hit an aircraft uh, if they were firing at the Cormoran. Uh, remember the machine gun fire uh, stopped these guns being manned. We'll just have a look now at a, a selection of photos from both uh, the 2008 and 2015 uh, uh, photos. Here's one of uh, the coloured ones of 2015. Just to go through here and have a look at some of the shell holes. That's uh, one of the turret hits. And here we've got more shell holes uh, 
straight through uh, with shells exploding inside, a Kali float uh, from the uh, debris field. The damaged uh, lifeboats, most of the boats uh, on the boat would have been uh, severely damaged. Uh, and here they are in a very damaged condition on the seafloor. Here's uh, what's left of the bridge. Uh, about the only thing really recognizing, recognizable is the compass uh, binnacle. Uh, at action stations, uh, a ship is closed up. Uh, here's a door open. Uh, who would know? Uh, maybe there was an abandoned ship uh, call. Uh, or people just at the end realized it was uh, better to get out. Their only chance of survival uh, was to get out of the ship. Uh, nobody will ever know. Uh, here's a very sad item, uh, a boot uh, with what looks like a shrapnel hole in it. Uh, there are no human remains. Let me explain simply why. Uh, when you're alive, you have positive buoyancy. Not a lot of it, but you do have positive buoyancy. You will float if you lie on your back. Uh, however, when you drown or die, you have negative buoyancy. Uh, the body uh, sinks through the water until it uh, sits on the ocean floor. If you're in the harbor, the temperature at the bottom of the harbor will be very similar to the, the uh, temperature at the top. Uh, the water pressure won't be a lot, i.e. 100 uh, feet. Uh, but when you go down 2468 meters, the temperature is very cold. The water pressure is enormous. Uh, body is not going to decompose and bloat and come up. It's going to stay down here. And there are marine organisms uh, that uh, uh, very quickly uh, remove any uh, human remains that were there. Here's the hull of the ship. Uh, all that broken plating is where the bow is attached. You're looking inside the hull of the ship here and where the bow is attached. Here's the bow upside down. Uh, they may have not been able to, when ships take a torpedo in the bows, uh, often them, uh, they'll drop the anchor and all the cable just to reduce the weight in the bow and reduce the stress on the structure. They may have not uh, been able to go forward uh, to release the anchors. They're still uh, there intact on the upside upturned bow. Here's a couple of interesting uh, photos, a 3D D photo uh, of the wreck as it sits on the seafloor and one as it's built. You can see uh, the gun directors and all of the superstructure that was here, the six inch and four inch have gone. All that's left uh, is the turntable, the funnels have gone, and of course the bow is gone. Uh, uh, interesting comparison between the ship as it was uh, afloat and as it sits on the seafloor. However, we've got lots of things here that are unknown and uh, unfortunately unknowable. It wasn't uh, a simple uh, expedition to find the ship and uh, they had two cyclones which resulted in nearly everyone on board being seasick and lots of equipment failures, the sonar, the cable, the lights and lots of disappointments. What they thought was a ship it was a geological uh, outcrop. Uh, so lots of things. This was huge news around the world. Uh, you can see it was only 43 days at sea and only 64 hours to find the Cormoran, 67 to find the Sydney. Uh, but look at the number of photos that were taken, the number of families contacted, 12 million hits on the Finding Sydney uh, uh, website and 60,000, the virtual press room. This was big news around the world. Sydney is found. Now, if we're looking for ships today, just a quick update on the technology. Uh, we're talking about finding the AE-1 here. The Fugro Equator, it's sitting there. It's using its multi-beam sonar to map out the ocean floor below it. And this is an automated underwater vehicle. Uh, it, the map of the seafloor is loaded into this, so it will go. It can go very close to the seafloor because it knows where it is. It's got sonar, echo sonar, all sorts of equipment on board. This is like a torpedo, it's battery powered, so it can be launched and it can go on a search. It found after 12 unsuccessful searches for AE-1, AE-1 was found in two hours. Here's the 3D uh, photo of it uh, from the uh, Curtin University. And uh, you can see it's gone below its dive depth. The front of it has been crushed, imploded, dragged the conning tower forward. So that's the technology of the day. But we're finding lots of ships uh, now. Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, Microsoft 
unfortunately no longer with us. It's just, this is uh, his hobby, uh, to go out and bring some closure and to complete the story of what happened to these ships. The Indianapolis, you probably know, uh, took the atomic bomb to Tinian Island to be loaded on the Enola Gay, and uh, the Lexington lost in the Battle of Coral Sea, and the last two uh, are uh, Japanese aircraft carriers. This is the quality of photos they're getting. Uh, that's a photo of a uh, plane off the Lexington. So what was the impact on the crew families when Sydney was found? Over the years, the relatives had kept the story and the memory of loved ones alive, through, uh, but had felt ongoing heartache. There'd been a number of false claims. And of course, every year on the 19th of November, there was fresh media publications about the loss of the ship and the incredible media coverage of the finding. Uh, the investigations that then followed on how and why Sydney met her end were printed and to many of the family's uh, members, they found that very difficult uh, to digest. Uh, you know, knowing how did my loved one die, which had been a question in their minds for so many years, and have the horror of the wreck videos and photos brought to reality the shocking pounding that Sydney took at the hands of Cormoran and actually Sydney was classified later on uh, by the Navy as being destroyed by Cormoran would have been extremely difficult to bear. My father did not ever want to look at the wreck uh, photos or videos. It was just uh, far too traumatic. Many, many family members over the years that had followed had suffered trauma. Uh, my grandmother for one had a nervous breakdown a couple of years after the ship was lost. And then a few years after that, she uh, suffered from bowel cancer. Who's to know whether the stress of losing her much loved first son and a very close son would have had that impact on grandma. And I know that many other women suffered nervous breakdowns as a result of the loss of family members of Sydney. Uh, there were services over the wreck site that some family members were fortunate enough to go and uh, take part in that. And you could ask yourself, was there now closure for the family members after the wrecks had been found? The Macquarie Dictionary classifies closure as bringing to an end or conclusion something, a sense of completion or finality, but the most uh, pressing meaning is acceptance of loss. Maybe some people there was acceptance of loss, but for many relatives and for me personally, I don't think there can ever be closure because we don't know actually why this happened or how, how could it have, we know that what happened as the action, we know all the facts, but we just still can't get over the fact that such a superior ship got so close and gave away all her tactical advantages. And I know from speaking to some other ladies that they have found this something that they just don't seem to be able to get past. After all the information was uh, collated and the, the thousands of photos and videos, uh, the Coal Commission of Inquiry uh, was started and they made some, some major findings. But what was good about the Coal Commission of Inquiry, it was given enough teeth to have a lot of expert help. The Defence Science and Technology Organisation and the Royal Institute of Naval Architects Australian Arm went to huge lengths to do a lot of scientific testing and modelling as to how and what how and why Sydney met her end, what was her ability to float and fight. So the major findings of the Coal Commission of Inquiry were that the destruction of Sydney's bridge and DCT resulted in the deaths of many officers and disruption to her firing ability. But still her command structure stayed in place because she was able to continue firing throughout the action after the bridge was destroyed. Obviously the XO must have been in the alternate conning position doing his best from there. No reason to doubt the German account of the action and Detmer's position as to the battle location. The German account of damage made it unlikely Sydney's boats could be used by survivors. The photograph said it all. The damage to the vessels confirmed the closeness of battle. Captain Burnett made an error of judgment, but some also re responsibility also rests with the Naval Board for underestimating the threat of German auxiliary cruisers and their offensive capabilities and the deficiencies in Tactical Note 9. Tactical Note 9 came out with explicit procedures to follow as to 
when you identify a ship um, as a friend or foe. And after the um, after the uh, loss of Sydney, actually, Tactical Note 9 was um, uh, uh, changed. So we have this incredible memorial to Sydney in Geraldton. The Sydney crew are remembered in memorials across this country in stone, in bronze, in metal. They'll, their names will be on long after the rest of us are into dust. And this is a national memorial and it came about through incredible work by the citizens of Geraldton and the Rotary Club of Geraldton. The aspects are the, the granite walls with all 645 crew representing the embracing arms of the nation. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the Dome of Souls, 645 stainless steel seagulls in a cupola supported by seven pillars representing the seven seas. This, the seagulls uh, came about because at the dedication of the site, a flock of seagulls flew over Mount Scott, and it is also thought that in naval folklore that seagulls would represent the souls of lost sailors. Uh, the uh, floor and the altar, the altar being a propeller representing Sydney's propeller disappearing between down below the waves as she sank. Uh, the floor is made up of granite from the seven states and territories of this country representing the crew who came from all the states and territories. Uh, and the Pool of Remembrance was the last uh, um, aspect completed. Uh, there is a map on the floor of the Pool of Remembrance of the area off Shark Bay. Uh, you can see the circle of seagulls here. There are 644 seagulls here. And the 645th, its wingtip is touching the spot off the coast of Western Australia where the wreck of Sydney lies. These steps indicate the depth that she lays at. And the most impressive aspect of this, I think, is the waiting woman. A woman in 1940s clothing, holding her hat, staring out to sea, which was placed several years before the wreck was found. And the ultimate irony is that the <coughs> angle that this woman is looking out on, if you take it out to the wreck site, it, it, it intersects with the wreck, wreck site. I mean, that's a little bit chilling, if nothing else. And the stella. Uh, stella uh, or monumental stones, would often be standing at sacred sites or used for funerary purposes. So it really is, I think, a memorial of world class. And uh, it's very nice to know that recently the Royal Australian Navy gave permission for the White Ensign to be flown there. There are other memorials, this basic cairn in Cobber Station, uh, the memorial in Carnarvon, where there's also 645 individual plates along the waterfront and also by Smith Sculptures, this lovely memorial at Denham where the ship's outline can be seen at certain times of the day. The names of the sailors are portrayed as in, in wavy motions and the red poppies indicating the poppies that were scattered over the wreck site from an aircraft. But there's one piece of this puzzle that is still to be resolved. And this is of the unknown servicemen. We know that there was a body in a, in a life raft floating off Christmas Island in February 42. It was hurriedly buried because the Japanese were about to overrun the island. Uh, it was given cursory uh, in, in investigation by the local doctor. The Navy uh, did a search for the body in 2001 and finally located it in 2005. Uh, we know that the body had um, injuries. There was a shell fragment in the head and um, it was also clad in overalls that had disintegrated, but behind the press studs of those overalls were still some fragments of um, fabric. Uh, this man has an unusual dental uh, profile. So based on that, 330 men of the Sydney crew were eliminated. We know that he was less than 30 years of age because the epiphyseal plate on his clavicle wasn't fused. They worked out the length of his femur, so 200 more were excluded. And the clothing would have indicated possibly he was from the engine room. DNA and isotope uh, sampling has been done to give us a lot more information on this man. The shell fragment was analysed and found to be the same chemical compound as German armour piercing shells. And finally, he was buried with honours in the Geraldton War Cemetery on the 19th of November 2008. The search for this man's identity continues. 
I've been helping Commander Greg Swindon look through um, archives and genealogical records to try to find records. It's a two step forward, one step uh, back process. I would like to think that we could identify this man at some point, who's to know? It would be lovely to think he could be identified before the 80th anniversary. So I'll just keep plodding on with my bit of research whenever I can help Commander Swindon as others are doing. And let's hope that we will find the identification of this man to close the circle in the HMA of Sydney story. So finally, we've got to remember what the final outcome in all of this was, that Sydney upheld the finest traditions in the Royal Australian Navy. Terence Cole stated it as such, although Sydney was lost, she succeeded in ridding the sea lane of an enemy raider. This is hugely important and I think of a comfort for many family members. If, if Sydney had been unsuccessful in putting Cormoran out of action, who knows how many other lives would have been lost by the mines that she laid or the ships that she'd attacked. So they did what a warship was supposed to do, and that is defend herself and take down her enemy. She had a young crew, many of whom had only been 50% rotated on in the months preceding. So we should look at this as a tragedy for the families, but a success for Sydney. And finally, um, Naval Historian Vice Admiral Peter Jones stated that HMAS Sydney 2 deployment in the Mediterranean was the single most successful deployment ever undertaken by an RAN ship. So we'll just come now to the fact that John Curtin stated there will always be a Sydney. We now proudly have Sydney 5 uh, sailing. She was commissioned at sea during the pandemic and we'll now um, thank you for your attention and we will have questions. Well, thank you very much, Gillian and Noel. It's been such a comprehensive uh, review of the tragedy and its aftermath and really there are no further questions that we can ask at this particular stage. But before uh, we go to Noel, tell us about the next uh, event, perhaps on behalf of us all to thank you both very much for your thoroughly well researched and very interesting presentation about this awful tragedy and its everlasting aftermath. And to thank you for your real continuing interest in Navy history and your support to our society. Again, thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, have a nice day. Stay well, stay safe. Goodbye.